we're going to be plastering this, we're going to be plastering these, we're going to be plastering that, and we're going to be plastering all this, and we're going to show you how. The mix we're using on this, we've got uh, Calbux, uh, which, we, which is a calcium oxide, which we're basically mixing with a fine uh, grit sand. And we're mixing that at two and a half parts sand to one part lime, which is giving us a really creamy, st sticky mix. The sand is just a grit sand, a local grit sand. It's washed and, and, and it's fairly decently graded, so it's, it, makes, it makes a good plastering sand. There's probably um, a few more fans in it than what you'd want to, to use on some other kind of lime works, but it works well as a plaster. Yeah, so we're mixing this in the uh, little portable bio mix we've got, and, um, and then we're adding the uh, fibres in as well, which is going to give us, um, you know, it's going to help with it shrinking and the cracking, and, and it's going to bond the plaster work together. We generally mix up quite a lot of mortar for the for the project, so two or three days before we'll start batching it, and we'll put it into the plasterers' baths, and then we'll just let, let it sit there. So what we what we're basically doing. We're running the pre-mix motor that we've done uh, a couple of days ago, running that back through the mixer, uh, working it up, uh, maybe adding a tad of water with it to make it to a good consistency. And then uh, using that straight on the walls. The lath plaster, what we're going to do with that, uh, we want a little bit of hydraulic set because we haven't got the suction uh, like we have with the brickwork when we're doing the walls. We need a little bit of hydraulic set in there uh, to make it go or else it, it can end up in a cold building like this. It can end up hanging for a long time in, in a wet state and you, you're waiting for it to, to dry out. And also we need the plaster slightly stronger as well because we're actually going onto the laughs and we're going to have the uh, nibs folding over on the back of the laughs. You've then basically relying on a ceiling, you're like relying on all their nibs to, to hold in place. So, um, we, we generally like to put a bit of hydraulic set in there so that it gives it more residual strength as well. Yeah, so we're using GGBS in this and we're probably looking about 10% of the mix volume. So it won't give us a, a strong hydraulic set, but it'll just uh, allow it to, 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 to take up and, and set um, so that we can get on it uh, you know, within four or five days and, and give it a bit more residual strength when, uh, well, when it dries um, for going on the laughs. What we generally do on when we're putting this first base coat onto the brickwork is we don't try and hit it all at once with a 10 mil or a 12 mil coat all in one hit. What we do is we put on a really, really tight coat onto the brickwork that is basically worked in really well because what we're wanting is this first coat, we need it to adhere. When you put it on in one big hit, is you can't get that working into the brickwork like what Luke's doing now because you're only going to have um, a, a fairly uh, weak setting uh, mortar with this because it's not a gypsum mortar where you've got um, a lot of uh, strength in there and bond to it uh, you need to make it basically have that bond by working it in well and then what we'll do is we'll get this tight coat on and then we'll get um, you'll see he's just done a bit up above where he's put the uh, 10 mil on and what we'll do then is we'll build the output as that, that'll make up then as first 10 mil 10 mil coat and what you generally find is if you're going up above uh, 10 12 mil with this lime you're going to get a, a lot of cracking on there uh, so we generally find that you know little and often works better uh, you know 10 12 mil and build it and build it and build it from there and you just need to leave it let, let, let it crack you've just got to handle it and let it let, let it crack Minimise it as much as you can, uh, but then we'll show you later on how to deal with the cracking in the base coats. But ultimately, once you come out to your float coat, you don't want any cracking in there whatsoever. And, and all, what you're trying to do, you need to get probably you know 80% of your levelling work done on done on these base coats. Your float coat just wants to be the setting coat for your top coat. You don't want to be trying to level out on your on, on your float coat. It, it's this is extremely easy compared to gypsum plastering because you you haven't got that setting that set setting time that you have with gypsum with this so these walls we're probably going to leave these now about three days 
four days. Um, they will take a bit quicker because it's um, brick, brick work. But yeah, ultimately you haven't got that set setting time that you have with gypsum, so you've got time to play with it and, and work it and, and, and get it right. Rather than with gypsums, you know, you've got you've got that, that setting time and it has to be done uh, within that setting time. So for beginners, this is absolutely ideal uh, to learn with. Uh, it takes a bit to master, you know, trial techniques and using the handboard and using the trial and getting the mix right. But it's fantastic to learn. Yeah, so now we've got now we've got this uh, backing coat on. Uh, what what we do? We have this, uh, what we call a grid floor. And what we're trying to do is, we don't want that trowel finish because for his next base coat, we're not gonna get addition to a smooth trowel finish uh, plaster. So what we're doing is we're going over with this grid floor. Because we're using a coarse grit sand, what it's gonna do is it's gonna tear open that surface. You need the bonding between these coats, these base coats and the float coats. You need this bonding um, to be as good as possible so you don't end up getting separation um, at, at a later date. Basically what we're trying to do is when we put the next base coat on here we're wanting the material to go in between the scratches so we get that cohesive bond between the layers but the problem is when you use a little wire scratcher uh, we've got three mil aggregate in here that down uh, so you don't get any aggregate into the little wire scratches that it leaves so what we do is we have this last scratcher uh, and we just use laughs and chop it up and make this fancy little scratcher. It's really easy to do, it takes about 10 minutes. And basically, we've got the width of the, um, of the laughs then, which is probably about six mil. So we're gonna get then, when we put these scratches in, we're gonna get aggregate going in between uh, the scratches that we put on there. So we've got a good cohesive bond between the first base coat that we put on or the float coat, the next base coat. So every layer then is, is well bonded. Uh, to the to the one previously, um, so yeah, all, all we do it's pretty pretty easy to uh, scratch up. We do, tend to do it on diagonals, um, both ways. And you see, it tears up that surface, um, and also the hair in there as well. Uh, gets pulled out from that base coat and you get them bonding from the hair between the coats. So, yeah, anybody that, uh, anytime I see plastering done that's been scratched up with a, a standard plastering comb, if you will, um, it just drives me crazy. I, um, you just don't get that good bond between the layers by using, uh, you know, standard plaster is uh, scratching coat and you see now on this we've got um, we've, we've got the hair strands coming out and we've got a good key then for his next coat to go on. The test I like to do is basically I, I, I think of it as like cold blue type that when this plaster you need that kind of force to indent it that you'll do with, with the cold blue blue type that's when it's ready to get the next coat put on. We're gonna have to keep this damp as well so next few days might once or twice a day might just slightly mist it down to keep the we want we, we don't want the wall to dry out we need that moisture in the wall and we need that uh, background moisture to be ebbing out as we're plastering plastering out so the laughs are basically small strips of timber that have been sewn to size in this case and they're basically just just to hold the, the new plaster work that's going to be installed. They've been sitting in water for between 24 and 48 hours. We'll wet them again tonight before we leave. Tomorrow morning, before any plaster's applied, they'll have two, three, four wettings down just to, to ensure, because you want them wet enough so that they're holding the moisture, but not wet enough so that they're dripping. We're using a, a pneumatic coil gun, just for speed really, but it, it can be done with just, just a hammer and nail, just stainless steel uh, ring shank nails. It'll take longer do, doing it by, by hand, but it's certainly that's the way it was always done. It's, by hand. it's the old way of plastering. Nowadays, you just put plasterboard up and, and, and skim it, but but this is is the, the old way of doing it. So so what happens when when you when you plaster plaster on laughs? You've got these gaps in between the laughs, and and when you apply the plaster, it comes up behind the laughs and creates a key by just hooking around the back of the laughs, and that. That basically gives it its hold. You plaster from the bottom, uh, you just apply it, apply it here like this, 
Uh, you don't go on the top, you don't do anything to the top, you leave it to naturally create its key. Uh, yeah, and it, it just holds it well in place. It sets relatively slow, really, um, but because you've got the suction to the laths, which you wet beforehand, uh, and the plaster's really sticky, and, and you have fibres in your plaster as well to hold it together, it's so labour intensive, because you've got to apply multiple coats and you've got to take the time to apply all these individual laughs and nail every single laugh to every single joist. Uh, whereas if you just, just get a, a plaster board, you just stick it up and screw it up and that's it, it's job done. But this, this is definitely the, the, the way that needs doing in, in restoration jobs. We've just got a, a laugh up the top of there and then once this brick works back in as well, we've got to fill in down that edge up there with the laughs and the rest of the, the plaster work's going to be done applied directly to the brickwork. I'm currently plastering the lap work. Uh, the majority of the stonework has now been done. Um, it's had a few days drying now. It bonds a lot better because if the gaps in between the lats, the plaster work goes through the lats and all, almost like mushrooms on the back of it, like a hook, if you will, and hooks onto that so you get a lot better bond. If it didn't have the gaps, you're almost, you're almost plastering onto a, um, a smooth surface, so there'd be no, no key for the, for the plaster to um, adhere to. So eventually it'd dry out and it'd just peel off. Um, almost like uh, last time when we were really working the plaster into the stonework, that gives you the key for the next course. It's just a very, very traditional way of doing it. Um, obviously, a lot of buildings now go towards gypsum, so you have plasterboard and skim, uh, like multi-finish, board finish, that kind of thing, purely because it's um, that's how everyone does it now. But obviously, with heritage work, we do this a lot more than normal people would, um, but even so, it's quite rare that you do lap and plaster work now. If you don't wet your lats, it dries and where the hook goes through the lats, it then cracks the, the hook, if you will, on the back. So then you're back to as if you had no gaps in between them because that hook's cracked, you haven't got a, a good bond to it. And if you want to do lat and plaster, you've just got to, you've got to get that pressure right. Because if you put, say if you do a bit like this, if you put, too much pressure on you, not it's going through the lats too much, it's just getting that pressure right. So, when you do it, it's just catching on them lats just enough so it hooks through, but then not not enough so it too much goes through, but not too less that you don't get that hook through. It's just that right amount of pressure. And um, we'll just probably leave it until tomorrow morning, let it go off a bit because it is still a bit wet. Um, Wait until it's tightened up a bit and then go over it with a grid float like we did with the wall and then um, scratch it, just give it a light scratch, not as deep as what we've done on the walls and then it'll be a float coat and then a top coat and then be done. This is just lamp putty that we use as a top coat if you will. You're building up the um, final coat of the plaster using a run uh, that we've built out of tin um, just to get the angles same all the way around on all the doorways. So I'm just put, put a bit on, put the run on, let that go off a bit, put a bit more on, run it again and just build it up slowly like that. This is a more fine kind of um, lime plaster rather than your gritty sandy type to get a nice smooth finish on um, for the for a final coat if you will. If you're using lime backing you should use lime top as well. There's different types of lime topping coat but this is just the lime putter that we use. It just uh, adheres well with the lime backing. Um, it's just better to use lime all the way through rather than top it with a gypsum if you will. Uh, it sets slightly quicker, um, it all depends on the environment as well, so it is quite cold and damping where we're doing this, so 
but it gives you plenty of time to work with it but it's a lot finer and a lot thinner more like a, a finish gypsum if you will rather than a, a heavy backing cork so he's building it up now with some wet and then just keep running your mould until you get the profile you need So you can see where you're running it, when you're running it you can see that this angle is getting there now but you see that there's uh, plastic missing on this corner so let's get some more on that corner and build it up from there. Uh, well we've made this tin, um, you, it's not something that you'd buy off the shelf per se, um, you just because every angle is different uh, that you work with so it's just something that you have to knock up, take measurements and Obviously when this was originally done um, many years ago, it will all have been done by eye and cast by eye so none of it is, not everyone's the same but for what we, we're doing it's just a lot easier to get it um, somewhere near what it were. So you could, um, like on the on the sills I've done behind you there, I've used um, battens just to get somewhat of a straight edge on the uh, sills and frames. And you can do it with that, you could stick a button on the side and do that face and then buttons and do that face and work to the buttons but just to cast it in one it's a lot easier to use a run. Yeah, so this will be the last cork. Um, all I'm doing is I'm just building up the corners on the door frames and then working from that. So you get um, so you're not trying to hand hand mould the door frames if you will. So it's just a case of keep adding bits on, running your mould, adding a bit more on, running your mould and getting it right. So what we do now is uh, let that tighten up a bit now, um, it's just because it's wet and it's dragging a little bit, so we'll let that tighten up a bit and then we'll just put a bit more on, uh, run it again, put a bit and just keep going until you've got that final finish. It's been a few weeks since we put the last quarter back and court on and we've had to leave it a few weeks um, just because of how damp it is in this building. Um, it's, a, it's a very old building so it just retains moisture. So when the moisture evaporates from plastic it goes into the atmosphere and then it has nowhere to go so it's condensating and then the plaster is sucking it back in. So it's a continuous cycle so we've had to just leave the main door open and get some ventilation in um, just to try and let it dry out a bit. Um, the top coat is your finishing coat, so it's a lot um, less gritty than the backing coat. The backing coat you rub up, ready to key it up for um, the top coat. We don't put um, a key on this because obviously this is your finishing coat. Um, obviously it's still lime. It's like a, a soft cheese, if you will, rather than the backing coat which is really heavy. Um, Obviously with the backing court because of the weight of it you have to build it up in layers whereas this is quite a light plaster compared to how you can put it on. So we've got my normal trowel to put it on and then we've got like a what I use as a finishing trowel, it's a lot more flexible so you get a really nice um, finish on it. Top coat, what, we've, what I've done is uh, put the backing coat on and gone around with a straight edge and just tapped on the wall to see the thickness of what it is all the way around and once it's a unified thickness to the existing plaster um, then we can go over the top coat. You can get cracking in the top coat, but that's usually if you put it on too thick. So if you keep it uh, quite thin, and if you do need to build it up, you can put another layer on once it's started to set, um, and then that should uh, alleviate the cracking. Yeah, so this is the last step of plastering, if you will. Um, obviously, you've got your decorating to do afterwards, but um, putting plaster on the wall as this is the last step. Been here a while now, that, but yeah, yeah, it's coming on quite well. Starts to make a difference once you put top coat on. Looks more like a finished product. <laughs>